I'd like to welcome I'd like to welcome you all tonight to this start of our two-day events on gender justice and neoliberalism in South Asia. Uh, tonight's event is specifically focusing on gender violence, neoliberalism, and the Hindu right. I was about to say turn off your phones and mine is ringing. <laughs> um, and tomorrow we'll be having a full day symposium on gender justice and injustice and the neoliberal state in South Asia. Um, just to do a few housekeeping um, announcements before we begin. Um, the first is to please turn off your mobile phones. Um, we're, we are recording um, and we're recording not just the, the discussion and um, any, any kinds of interactions that happen between our two speakers, but we'll also be recording the Q&A. So if you don't want to be recorded, then I suggest you don't ask a question. <laughs> and if you don't want to be recorded, you might want to think of sitting in the back. Um, we will have a link to that on the South Asia Institute um, website through the events page, and um, you can access it there. Um, I've already started doing the housekeeping. I should also begin by saying that this event is being jointly organized um, by Freedom Without Fear platform, the London School of Economics Gender Institute, and the SOAS South Asia Institute. So this is a very much a collaborative effort. Um, and it's a very exciting time for us really to be able to put our energies and ideas together during times where, which I think are really in need of some critical discussion and reflection on the things and events that are going on in South Asia in the context of neoliberalism. Okay, so um, Kalpana Wilson and I will be co-chairing tonight's event, and I will, I will, without going any further, I'll allow Kalpana to introduce our two speakers. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Tej. Um, well, as as Tej has already said, we're very excited to be able to um, to be able to host um, these two speakers, and I'm going to introduce them in a moment. Um, and um, I'm not going to say very much because I know you're eager to hear them. Um, but I just wanted to say that um, this is a really important event for us because in a way it's the first chance we're having here in London to reflect on the implications and specifically the gender implications um, of what has been happening in India since um, the Hindu right came to power at a national level through the victory of uh, Narendra Modi and the BJP um, in the national elections last May. Um, we're also, of course, coming up very soon to the anniversary of the um, genocidal violence which took place in Gujarat in 2002 against the Muslim minority community. Um, in which, as we know, women were particularly targeted for the most horrific forms of violence. And um, the survivors of 2002 are still waiting for justice. Um, and they and those who support them are continually facing attempts to silence them by the state. And meanwhile, we're seeing um, across the country uh, in recent months, attempts to replicate that violence in a number of different places, and this is something which uh, both our speakers are going to uh, talk about. Um, now, finally, before I um, before I introduce them, I want to just pass on to you um, a very brief message of support which the Freedom Without Fear platform received from um, Nikhat Said Khan who is a leading feminist activist and scholar in Pakistan. Um, and she said in her message that the 12th of February is a very important day in Pakistan and celebrated as Pakistan Women's Day in honor of those women who came onto the streets and battled <coughs> against the military government, the so-called Islamicization of Pakistan and women's rights. Uh, fear kept everyone silent from 1977 to 83 when we broke the silence by demonstrating on the streets of Lahore. Most were beaten by heavily armed police. Many were arrested, many hit by tear gas, but no woman left the battle. And she concludes by saying, I'm very happy to hear that this meeting in London is taking place on this day. Um, 
So um, we're really extremely honored to have with us today uh, Professor Tanika Sarkar. Um, she's Professor of Modern History in the Center for Historical Studies at Jawaharlal Nehru University in Delhi. Um, and um, many of us here have been uh, inspired by uh, her really groundbreaking work. Um, which for the first time uh, made women's own voices in colonial India uh, audible. Um, she's ex published extensively on women and the Hindu right, on cultural nationalism and the politics of Hindutva, um, as well as social reform in colonial and post-colonial India and peasant and workers' movements. Um, among her recent books, some of the most influential have been uh, Hindu Wife, Hindu Nation, which appeared in 2001, and Rebels, Wives, Saints, which appeared in 2009. Um, and as I'm sure many of you uh, will agree, her work has always made very strong connections with um, the, the questions and the struggles which we are facing in the present. Um, and of course, this is very much the case with her work on the Hindu right. Um, many of us, too, will never forget her seminal article on the Gujarat genocide, uh, Semiotics of Terror, Muslim Children and Women in Hindu Rashtra. Um, so we're going to hear first from uh, Professor Sarkar, um, but before that, I'll briefly also introduce to you uh, Kavita Krishnan. We're very excited to have Kavita Krishnan with us. Um, many of you uh, will know her. Um, as a leading feminist and left activist based in Delhi. Um, she was centrally involved in the, um, the anti-rape movement, uh, which began in Delhi in December 2012, um, both as a participant as well as um, extensively writing and speaking about the movement and about the broader uh, questions it raised about gender violence in India and the struggle against it. Um, uh, Kavita Krishnan is the secretary of the All India Progressive Women's Association, APWA, uh, which is an organization active among women workers, among agricultural laborers, and among other sections of poor and laboring women in rural and urban India. It's an organization which has a record of resisting feudal violence and state repression against women. And Kavita is also the editor of Liberation. Um, the monthly publication of the Communist Party of India, Marxist-Leninist, the CPIML. Um, so uh, we're going to have the format uh, where uh, each of the speakers will, will talk to you, and then following both of their talks, we will be uh, opening it up to questions for the audience. So I'd like to hand over now to Dr. Sarkar. Thank you. Do you want me to stay here? Whatever you Thank you, Kalpana, for your very, very kind words. And thank you for having me here, uh, especially with Kavita. It's a great honor and pleasure. And I would also like to thank Navtej and Sana for their great help in arranging this. Now, we have a very large theme here, something that embraces almost all the critical issues in society and politics in India today. So I can only make a few and extremely general points to start off the discussion. <clears throat> now, as I understand it, and I'm not terribly clear about it, we are meant to consider a very highly pathologized situation shaped on the one hand by Hindutva extremism and on the other hand by neoliberal capitalism, which misleadingly calls itself reform and development. Within this, the specific focus is going to be on violence against women. Now, uh, tomorrow I'll say a bit more about possible links between Hindutva and neoliberalism. If there's an actual link, or is it merely a contingent temporal coincidence uh, two different processes growing together within the same time frame, but independently of each other. <clears throat> 
My own feeling is that they are connected, especially in their effects, if not in their intentions. Uh, there are fractures within each and each has doubts about the other. The uh, peasants and workers' wings of the RSS, Rashtriya Swayam Sevak Sangh, the apex organization of Hindu extremism, they resent the, some of the neoliberal aspects of um, the Modi governance. Uh, there are doubts about each other and I don't at all want to suggest a fully calibrated, seamless conspiracy or something like that. But I do strongly feel that they sustain and reinforce each other. And I'll give you a couple of examples how uh, that works out. Uh, for instance, the embrace of reforms gains Hindutva the massive approval of corporate powers who are not otherwise interested in the Hindutva agenda. And some of these sections, especially their representatives in the media, might even be quite uncomfortable about the violence involved in that. Hindutva, on the other hand, unleashes enormous Hindu popular energy and passion for a governance which is strongly inclined towards a form of developmentalism which is very strongly anti-people. Hindutva alone, and that's its greatest asset, so to speak, alone provides a quote-unquote moral frame for authoritarian governance, which the standalone economics of neoliberalism had so far lacked. Okay? The, uh, you know, the economic policies of reform have focused on the economics of development without having the resources to whip up popular passions, especially the passions of those who are going to suffer from these policies. Hindutva provides that resource. Uh, Dalits and Adivasis, Adivasi tribals, who are the worst victims of the neoliberal agenda, especially of the land acquisition processes, development by dispossession, are especially recruited for Hindu violence. The vision of Hindu nation, powerful, glorious, and vengeful, distract them, uh, fill them with dreams about a power that they lack, but which the nation can have access to. It distracts them from material distress of their own and it promises a measure of upward mobility, of comradeship with upper castes in violence, in violence against Muslims and Christians. Each acts, neoliberalism and Hindutva, acts to justify the other and to normalize a general climate of coercion and dispossession. Dispossession, whether of rights of religious minorities or of basic entitlements of subaltern classes and castes. Both legitimize, in different ways, assaults on vulnerable bodies. The present BJP regime, of course, is an explicit fusion of the two. Modi has more or less closed the gap between the two, Hindutva and neoliberalism. So I'll begin with the most extreme instances of gendered violence, the sensational series of rapes and killings that became global news since 16 December 2012. Maybe Kavita would uh, say something about that. And these happen often in large cities in public places, and I'll call them public rapes for lack of a better word. The events also produced, and we must never forget this, waves upon waves of protest, as tenacious and as continuous as the violence is. The extent of domestic, and I call them public rapes, uh, because the extent of domestic abuse and conjugal violence uh, conjugal rape is never calculated. And in fact, conjugal rape has not been named as a crime in our country despite years of women's struggles to do, to name it thus. In the last few years, of course, it, um, you know, I don't even need to say this, there's been a massive explosion of popular rape, uh, public rapes. Uh, it's uncertain, I'm sorry, it's uncertain if it's a case of better reporting or if there's an actual increase. 
I, I myself lean towards the actual increase thesis. It seems as if each day competes with the previous one uh, to imagine and you know, perpetrate worse and worse forms of abuse and brutality on women. And the form of violence is much more sinister than its scale. It's accompanied with uh, a prolonged sexual torture, sexual mutilation, and it concludes with brutal murder. South Asian feminists are divided about how to talk about the details of such horror or whether to talk about them at all. Would a focus on the horror not sensationalize the matters unduly or would it not verbally repeat the rape? On the other hand, wouldn't keeping silence lose us the sense of shame and horror which may have mobilized valuable resources for sensitization. So this is a debate that goes on. Sexual violations, of course, are the limit case of a process that often begins before the birth of the woman in our country. India has the unique distinction of being the, having the worst sex ratio in the world which Amartya Sen has called the story of missing women, women who should have been there, but whose absence is not natural, but is man-made, made in the bosom of her family with feticide, female infanticide, and deliberate neglect. The very recent gruesome Rotak gang rape and murder case happened in a state with, the, with an especially bad sex ratio even for India. Some of us here may have seen Nisha Paheja's documentary film about a beauty contestant and about a Vishwa Hindu Parishad, a Hindutva activist woman. One is a sophisticated urbanite, the other is a rather boorish small town fundamentalist, not very well educated. What they have in common is a chilling familiarity with female infanticide as an established fact of life, which doesn't even surprise them. Uh, the beauty contestant, uh, uh, the beauty contestant has a Bombay-based, highly educated middle-class mother who was ordered by her family to kill off the second daughter, and when she refused, she was turned out of her home. The VHP girl, on the other hand, worships a father who beats her up regularly. Why? Because, as she says, I am a girl and still he did not kill me. How can I not worship him? This is such a rare, exceptional act. Are public rapes, then, a continuation and effect of usual patriarchal operations, you know, running from birth to death? Uh, at the risk of sounding melodramatic, I'm more inclined to see it, as Deborah Apostle sees it, as the emergence of a new realm of the monstrous, quite distinct from the run-of-the-mill patriarchy, which nonetheless prepares the groundwork for it. A well-known site for, uh, for the monstrous are, of course, communal pogroms. We don't have riots anymore in the country. It's always pogroms. It's one-way killing by a huge majority of a slender minority helpless people. Gujarat 2002, to which Kalpana referred, being a very telling example, at that time bodies of profoundly vulnerable Muslim women were freely available for gang rape, torture, sexual mutilation, killing sequence that I talked about at the beginning. In fact, it went a step further. Sometimes, uh, you know, wombs were particularly targeted and the unborn fetus would be hacked, uh, you know, and it has something to do perhaps with the imagined Hindu worry about a rampant growth of Muslim numbers. In fact, Gujarat, I strongly feel, rehearsed the script for the later public rapes. Uh, <clears throat> many of the features are absolutely identical. It created, too, uh, perhaps an insatiable appetite for violent sexual acts, even in non-riot situations. One having, once having done that, once having told the world that this, this has been done, I think a lot of people all over the country would be ready for a replay, even when there is not organized mass violence, and hence the public rapes. 
There have also been grotesque torture and rape of Catholic nuns too. But somehow anti-Christian atrocities are neither reported very widely nor you know, reacted against. I don't know why. The monstrous covers a large social ground too. At one social extreme, at one social pole, we had the bizarre Nitari killings in Delhi 2006, I think it was, when a super rich employer's house revealed cannibalized and sexually abused or skeletons of cannibalized and sexually abused child domestic workers. A situation of extreme power and extreme vulnerability throws up bizarre aggravations of normalcy, even though normal power relations have produced them in the first place. It is as if the normal sees its own image through the glass darkly. I won't call them abnormal. They are a continuation of the normal, but a horrible aggravation of it too. At the other pole, we have the December 16, 2012 event whose rapists, when rapists came from slums. Slums, which among other things, I mean, there has to be a, you know, a study of Delhi slums, uh, detailed, uh, you know, uh, <coughs> nuanced studies, but slums which oscillate between extreme insecurity and deprivations on the one hand and constant tantalization of senses and desires and aspirations for the rich man's world and for the rich man's commodities uh, <coughs> all the time made uh, which are made uh, continuously avail available as spectacle or a spectacle of spectacle by the mass media, but which constantly elude the, the actual grasp of the slum dwellers. So you have the images of the rich man's life at your fingertip almost on your mobile screen, but you can't ever touch it. The ceaseless incitation and frustration of aspirations probably build up to a rage that seeks out bodies that are even more vulnerable. <clears throat> In the late 1980s, Safdar Hashmi, a CPM cultural activist who was later killed by Congress thugs, devised what I think was a brilliantly innovative plan of taking theater to these slums not taking, you know, not staging uh, plays for the slum people, but involving the people of the slum in the writing, production, and acting out of plays of their own. That would, be, would have been something that would provide absorbing and creative alternatives to the mass media that they passively consume and to Hindutva campaigns, which are rampant in the slums, and about which I'll talk a bit tomorrow. After his death, sadly, neither his party nor the institutionalized commemorative events followed up on this. I think that was a great chance that was lost. Structural violence erupts into the spectacular, routinely almost, in caste uh, related violence. Upper caste rapes are demonstratively public, deliberately public, especially in villages. I mean, they are almost like a village feast or a village festival uh, watched by everybody. Uh, but they are rarely reported, soon forgotten, hardly ever there in the global media coverage. And they do not evoke, they do provoke uh, activist protests, but not the kind of national upsurge that the 16 December rapes mobilized. Uh, the Kailanji massacre is a, uh, you know, is a case in point. A Dalit woman had the audacity to build herself a proper house. And she and her family were tortured, uh, raped, killed in unspeakably, unimaginably obscene ways. Uh, <clears throat> the normal pathology of caste does explode in occasional unusual episodes of violence, but as Anupama Rao has remarked in another context, caste-related violence is usually classified as a category apart, away from gender violence, even when its form is explicitly gendered. So it becomes a case of caste violence, not of gender violence. The two are kept separate. 
There are, of course, multiple sides of what I called license violence. The amazing exemptions and protection for super-privileged categories like the armed forces under the Arms Forces Special Powers Act. Okay, it's almost the Special Powers Act's provisions are so wide, so all-embracing, so tenderly protective of the armed forces that it's almost an invitation to violence of all sorts, including sexual violence whether in Kashmir or in the Northeast. That too goes for violence against men and women in police custody who are suspected of links with Maoist uh, insurrectionaries. You know, any kind of suspected links would, you know, really um, be the end. Police custody is, of course, a place that is opaque and entirely unregulated. And hum laws against hu civil and human rights violations hardly operate there, even though there are very valiant civil and democratic rights groups which do their best to uncover and mitigate them. Uh, is there a problem? <laughs> so I'll wrap up and give the floor to Kavita in a minute because she's going to show a film, part of a film also. Of all the non-Western countries in the world, I think, <laughs> uh, I think India alone enjoys a rather good global press. Okay, I shouldn't resent that, but I do. She is seen as the world's largest democracy, which she is. I mean, not knocking the democratic rights or the, the you know, democracy in any sense. You know, I lived through the emergency. She is celebrated as a modern country, yet with a great civilization behind her, as the home of Gandhi and Nehru, and as a most hospitable sanctuary for corporate investments, even at the cost of our uh, you know, li of, uh, even at the cost of the lives, livelihood, land, and environment. Uh, <clears throat> on very rare occasions, the world is allowed to see something different briefly. Gujarat, 2002, Delhi, 16 December, 2012. Though never Khairalanji, nor the rape and killing of Manorama in Manipur by army men. Still, when at last something horrible, something monstrous in India does appear on the global radar, I think it demands of us to explore the larger and everyday structures of coercion and power that nourish and enable such grotesqueness. Thank you. Thank you very much, Tanika, for that very, very thought-provoking um, talk. And we will, of course, be having questions. But before that, we are uh, going to hand over to Kavita Krishnan. Yes. Um, I'd like to, um, and she's going to show a few clips. Things. Things. No. Um, words about when you're setting that up. Um, yeah. Uh, the, I'm just going to start with uh, showing two short clippings from a new film that has been made on the uh, communal violence anti-Muslim pogrom in Muzaffarnagar uh, in 2013 that basically uh, set the stage for uh, the Modi victory in a very big way. It uh, accounted for a huge increase in the number of seats that the BJP won in Uttar Pradesh, which is one of the large, which is the largest state in India. So I just want to start with uh, showing those two short clips. The name of the film is Muzaffar Nagar Baki Hai, which uh, the filmmaker has translated to say Muzaffar Nagar eventually, Muzaffar Nagar next, uh, something like that. And the filmmaker is Nakul Sani. If this film is a much longer film, I just wanted to show these two clips to you know start the conversation here. Um, you know, you can see in this film that, uh, you know, the way in which uh, the whole, you know, the, the, the language of honor uh, 
the language of uh, protecting women uh, and protecting the honor of the community by controlling women is something that was deployed to uh, incite the violence, the uh, communal violence in Muzaffarnagar, and to justify it subsequently and to harvest it for the ri for the for the elections. Uh, the person you heard speaking right in the beginning is Amit Shah, who is the uh, president of the uh, ruling Bharti Janta Party now, and uh, you uh, saw the language that he was using. And uh, it's also uh, uh, quite clear that the women in Muzaffarnagar are speaking so clearly about the fact that uh, that violence did not, uh, of course, it involved violence, sexual violence of the uh, of a very terrible kind against the Muslim women. Uh, there are seven women in Muzaffarnagar who are still awaiting, uh, uh, you know, any kind of progress in their cases. They have filed cases of rape. Uh, but those cases are not uh, moving anywhere because uh, the entire uh, state machinery, and this in includes, I, I should say that here, this includes the state machinery in Uttar Pradesh, which is not ruled by the BJP, which is ruled by the Samajwadi Party, where the police and the whole uh, prosecution machinery is actually working to somehow silence and demoralize those women rather than uh, you know move towards justice. Uh, but clearly the violence was not, only the violence that happened in that particular f moment of uh, communal violence in Muzaffarnagar. Uh, it was, it's also a violence that has continued since then because it's had an impact on the lives of both Muslim and Hindu women in Muzaffarnagar, which those women do talk about, that uh, now, uh, you know, in the name of protecting women, uh, girls are being told that uh, we, we can't let you move freely outside and so on. All that is also happening. And... Um, uh, you know, you think about it, uh, basically, when you think about the corporate and the communal agenda or the development and the Hindutva agenda, and there's a lot of attempts, uh, you know, you can see a lot of people trying to make sense of this and write about it in India now. And uh, you see people, as I said, trying to advise the, the present government that, uh, you know, uh, you need to... Uh, uh, maybe you need to uh, uh, tell your Hindutva lunatic fringe to stop what they're doing so that your development agenda can move forward so that uh, the progress that you want to achieve for the country can go on and so on and so forth. You you see a lot of uh, 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 liberal commentators trying to argue that. And I would say that um, it's interesting to me that um, the, one of the slogans that was raised in Muzaffarnagar as a rallying call for the violence against the profiled Muslim community, which was accused of uh, being the source of sexual danger for Hindu women, the rallying cry was, save your daughters. Save your daughters was the rallying cry. And the same slogan has now been issued by the prime minister himself uh, as a slogan which is supposed to be the rallying cry against sex selective abortion. Uh, to correct the sex ratio, which is what uh, Tanika also uh, spoke about. So if, uh, you know, is there, what is the relationship between uh, these two agendas? Is it that they are in completely, uh, is it that there is this progress and development and women's empowerment agenda, which can uh, move on, if only the, you know, the Hindutva groups that you see here were to uh, sort of be kept in check a little bit or uh, is it is it is that truly the case and i believe that uh, that is very far from the case because the way in which um the BJP is uh, making inroads in states where it has not had a presence, for instance, in West Bengal. Um, I've come across uh, West Bengal activists of the uh, uh, Hindutva groups boasting on social media about the fact that they have rescued a girl from a love jihad situation. And it's uh, amusing them that they don't see any contradiction in writing, that now we've rescued her and now the hard work begins of... Uh, uh, of convincing her that uh, she is a victim of love jihad. So uh, they're actually writing about this on social media, telling you which is which town they've done it in and all of that. And uh, clearly this is a method of mobilization, of mobilizing support that is very, very key, very, very central to the way in which the BJP is operating. And so uh, the use of the slogan, you know, the, the use of the Beti Bachao slogan, Save Your Daughter slogan, I don't think it is um, coincidental then that it, it should appear in a different way and it should gain a different kind of legitimacy in the context of sex selective abortion, in the context of, you know, India's progress development and some kind of almost a feminist kind of uh, uh, framework which uh, would be articulated by the prime minister. But, uh, you know, the, 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 uh, 
instead of there being a gap between those two places where the slogan uh, appears, I would say that we should look for uh, the way in which, uh, you know, what that slogan ends up meaning on the ground and uh, how it eventually ends up being actually a, a slogan that justifies the control, the surveillance over women, which is, of course, happening beyond the Hindutva groups, which is a fact of life in the caste uh, society uh, that we live in, which is, a, uh, you know, the, the denial of women's autonomy is, uh, I would say, the big problem in India. The, you, uh, you hear so much about the rapes and so on and so forth, but you, you, you hear very little spoken about uh, the, uh, the, the whole question of women's autonomy. And, which, and the denial of that autonomy, which goes beyond. It's not that the Hindutva groups are the only uh, uh, institutions which are militating against that autonomy. You have the caste institution. You also have uh, other structures, which I will talk about, other, other uh, circumstances in which uh, the denial of that autonomy is, uh, you know, there's a need to maintain uh, the lack of autonomy to hold back that autonomy. So I will talk about that a little um, uh, a, a, a little later. But uh, one of the uh, things which uh, you know I was thinking about how um, we need to sort of widen the frame beyond uh, in the episodes of uh, sexual violence or certain episodes of sexual violence that one has heard about. And uh, I won't uh, speak about those because I have spoken about them before and. Uh, Tanika also touched upon them, but I would say that we also need to think about, uh, you know, the other 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 ways in which um, um, violence or the uh, or repression is uh, uh, making itself felt. Uh, for instance, uh, in just in recent times, you've seen. I, I would say that in, in this whole, in the way in which the development agenda is framed, there is an attempt to frame activists who are uh, trying to talk about uh, uh, people's movements or the repression on people's movements or the denial of uh, the violence done against people's livelihood, uh, against and uh, in of indigenous communities, of uh, peasant communities, and especially of the women in those communities. Those activists are sought to be represented as the enemies of development. And uh, uh, for instance, recently, a Greenpeace activist in India was denied the right to travel to uh, uh, the UK uh, in order to uh, canvas about the violent effects of a, a company with uh, links in the UK of the SR mining, co uh, mining company. And um, the impact of uh, their mining projects on uh, uh, indigenous people and peasant uh, people, uh, peasants in India. So uh, I think that uh, th the fact that uh, uh, that happened, and then uh, I would say that even those who, have, who activists who are talking about issues of justice, it's almost as though the agenda of justice has to be jettisoned from uh, the vision of development. And uh, so justice is there when, you know, the justice is translated to mean this kind of uh, violence against certain profiled communities. So justice is being denied by the administration over some imagined instance of sexual violence against a Hindu woman. So you need uh, a pogrom to, uh, to, to, to avenge, to achieve justice. But uh, when it comes to, uh, you know, asking, seeking justice for the Gujarat uh, 2002 violence, for instance, just uh, 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 today, uh, uh, one of the leading activists, uh, Tista Setalwad, was uh, denied bail by a Gujarat court. And uh, she was on the brink of being arrested, but uh, there's a, she's uh, secured a stay from the Supreme Court. We'll know what's to happen tomorrow. But uh, on a concocted case of uh, misusing uh, funds that she received and so on and so forth. So this kind of uh, very um, vindictive targeting of uh, activists, and I'm just naming two instances, there are several, there are in, any number of other instances of this uh, that one could think of. But I would say that uh, basically the, you know, the, the very, uh, uh, you know, uh, on the one hand you have a vindictive sort of going after activists who are talking about justice. On the other hand, I would say that even in terms of the way in which politics is unfolding, it's almost as though uh, in terms of the alliances made, in terms of uh, 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 what is considered acceptable in terms of political alliances and so on, it's almost as though there too justice has to be uh, uh, jettisoned entirely. One of the instances would be, in my mind, is that, uh, you know, the uh, we still, we are yet to see what is to happen uh, 
in the government that is to be formed in Kashmir. But if there is an alliance there between the BJP and the uh, PDP, uh, you know, it's, we, are, we are being told that what is being negotiated is what is going to be the BJP's uh, um, position. Will it pursue through that government? Uh, what will they pursue vis-a-vis -vis Article 370 and so on? But there, uh, you know, the, uh, the talk of the BJP's position on uh, repression uh, in Kashmir, on uh, sexual violence in Kashmir, on the denial, on the uh, systematic impunity of which the Armed Forces Special Powers Act is only one instance there. These are things which it's almost as though they don't need to be talked about when an alliance is being contemplated there in uh, the valley for uh, there. If you look at Bihar also, where there's an attempt there for uh, the BJP to uh, manage to uh, break the ruling Janata Dal United Party there, and uh, they are reaching out to the Dalit chief minister there. I would say that you know when you have uh, prominent leaders like Ram Vilas Paswan who claim to speak for the Dalit community, or even the present uh, chief minister of uh, Bihar reaching out to the BJP, uh, uh, you wonder what happens then to the struggles for justice for the uh, Dalit victims of massacres there. Because uh, those who have been struggling for justice there have uh, got very little from the courts. Uh, they've been, there's been a series of uh, sort of serial acquittals, just like there were serial massacres earlier in the 1990s. You have serial acquittals now. And yet it's almost as though uh, political uh, contracts that are made there, the ways in which secularism is defined or the ways in which uh, political uh, alliance with the BJP is defined, all these can happen without uh, recourse to, without um, any uh, link with the whole question of justice. The other thing um, I think that um, I'd like to just touch upon is um, the other ways in which um, I would say that you know if you if you think about moral policing or the whole uh, question of protection of women and the ways in which that is used as a justification for uh, control increased control and surveillance on women and so on i would say that we also need to see how that operates uh, probably even beyond the uh, framework of uh, you know, uh, the way in which it's usually understood. It's usually seen only in the framework of Hindutva groups doing violence against intercommunity marriage or against you know, on Valentine's Day and so on and so forth. But I would say that again, uh, it, sh it should be seen in a larger framework of how it operates in uh, 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 beyond the Hindutva groups and beyond the framework only of, uh, you know, uh, uh, choices in terms of marriage and uh, in terms of how you dress or whether you celebrate Valentine's Day and so on. Because, uh, uh, and I'll be talking about this tomorrow at greater length, but I want to just touch upon it here today, that uh, you see how in factories in India today, uh, there are many instances where even recent, I'll just name a few recent instances where women workers in a factory in Kerala were uh, strip searched to uh, check whether uh, which of them was menstruating because uh, in order to punish whoever had left a sanitary pad in the uh, toilet. Now, uh, this happened in an uh, SEZ in Kerala. Uh, uh, um, and uh, you have another instance in, uh, you have... A, a new report in Tamil Nadu which has talked about how women uh, in the garment and uh, uh, textile factories in Tamil Nadu, many of them are rural migrants from um, Dalit households in rural Tamil Nadu and they, are, they live in hostels under extreme surveillance. Uh, where they are denied the use of mobile phones, where they are denied, uh, if, they use, if they are found using a mobile phone, they can be publicly humiliated. One worker attempted suicide after such humiliation and uh, being beaten up and humiliated in public after being found with a mobile phone on the factory premises. And one of the things is that, um, and, they, and they are prevented from speaking to outsiders, speaking to male co-workers. And in some factories, they are even uh, discouraged from uh, speaking to women co-workers. Now, what does this say? Because now all this is justified by factory managements in the name of we are in the position of the parents. We are the parents are uh, you know uh, handing over their girls to us as uh, to work for us, and we have to protect them. This is all for their protection. And uh, these kind of restrictions in the name of protecting them is clearly something that is happening uh, in a wider uh, frame as well. And I would say that where the Hindutva agenda comes in here and you know, where a Hindutva government in power, what does that mean? It also uh, links up with, if you look at the BJP's uh, 
election manifesto in 2014, they talked about uh, a lab the labor industry family. They talked about the industry family. So trying to redefine the space of industry uh, as being not one in which the workers would be struggling for their rights against the management or against the factory owners, but as a family in which all could have a place. Of course, this is very much to do with the RSS agenda uh, in which they try to redefine caste also, recast caste also in this language of family. They recast industry also in this language of family. But the point is that um, uh, that uh, g given that these are al already existing means in which women, uh, women workers are disciplined in uh, factory spaces, uh, the very presence of a BJP government uh, with an agenda where they have already, without any changes in the labor laws yet, uh, the prime minister has just made an announcement that uh, Industries do not, they can just announce self compliance with labor laws. They do not have to, uh, there will be no state uh, super, uh, supervision of compliance with labor laws. So clearly, it's exactly like saying we will not interfere in the family. Similarly, we will not interfere in the factory. And, uh, you know, self compliance is good enough. And uh, there are many other uh, instances in which we, we can see, and I just want to very briefly touch upon before I end, uh, to talk about what we should also think about what are the implications of uh, the recent dilutions in the land ordinance, land acquisition ordinance. We should remember that it is women who have been at the forefront of struggles uh, against land grab um, almost uh, uh, everywhere in the country that such struggles are taking place even today. And uh, the very fact that a land uh, acquisition uh, law that was uh, that was one with a great deal of struggle is being uh, diluted so soon within the first six months of this government coming to power. The implications of that um, for women, the implications of that, uh, uh, the implications of the, uh, it's just as factories are being told self-compliance will do, uh, environmental laws are also, and uh, regulations are also being uh, similarly, we are being told that we, uh, you know, uh, those will not be uh, strictly implemented, and we will simply accept uh, any uh, uh, you know, compliance. You just have to say that you've done it, and everything is in place, and we will accept it, that kind of thing. And uh, what are the implications of all of this for uh, for uh, uh, women um, and the fact that we need to think about violence against women in these contexts as well. Um, and uh, I think that that is where the whole corporate and the communal agenda do meet. Because it is not that such violence has not existed when there has not been a communal government at the center. Such violence has been uh, uh, widespread and epidemic. But I think that the ways in which uh, such violence uh, can be justified, can be legitimized, can be normalized, and uh, can become uh, more legitimate uh, tools of governance and uh, tools of development, uh, I think uh, are what we are confronting today. And that is what, uh, as activists and movements do, we are confronting, uh, you know, we are confronted with the uh, challenge of resisting. So I, I'll end there, I think. Okay, thank you very much for that, Kavita. Um, I'm sure a lot of people are um, uh, eager to ask questions to both the speakers. I just uh, very quickly wanted to tell you, by the way, that um, the film which Kavita showed clips from, um, which is called Muzaffarnagar uh, Baki Hai, um, is a very interesting film, very much worth seeing. She's actually brought a copy with her this time. And we are going to be having a screening of the full film um, on the 24th of February at 7 o'clock, and that will be in the Vernon Square building, uh, room number V211. So that's on the 24th of February. Um, okay, so I'm going to um, open up the floor for questions, and um, we'll take um, three questions at a time. There are roving mics, so please wait till you get a mic before you start speaking. And um, do keep your questions brief so that we can have the maximum number of people getting to participate in this discussion. Um, yeah, so, yeah. I'm going to take three questions now, yes. Um, right. um, so this question, can you hear me? Yes, yes. Yeah, okay, yeah. Uh, the question is aimed at uh, Dr. Sarkar. Talk in the, um, the mic. Right. No, it's 
just works. works. Yes. Beautiful. Um, sorry. So, uh, Dr. Sarkar, how you said during your talk that uh, it seemed like the real number of uh, rape cases or well, sexual assault cases had increased dramatically. I was wondering uh, what made you think so? I mean, what was the cause for your uh, inference? Um, hi, yeah, I'll just, I'll just try and make this really quick. Um, so I was really interested in Kavita, what you were saying about um, the factory as a place to discipline women, um, the ways in which they, women aren't allowed to talk to male co-workers. Um, and that's like a really interesting parallel to schools in India. Um, and um, I went to school in Bangalore and some, uh, like a child in my school committed suicide recently um, because she was suspended for talking to a boy. Um, and there have been several cases like that of child assault in schools, but also like this enforcement of discipline of women within the school. And I was kind of wondering what kind of comments you might have on that. Um, I think it's really easy to maybe apply a Marxist analysis and then say, you know, oh, the school's just um, a place to, like, you know, breed um, workers and, like, you know, instill the same sense of values of discipline in them. But a lot of these incidents have also happened in schools, you know, of the bourgeoisie, like, where the incredibly rich Indians go um, and are disciplined into not talking to boys in their class, like not being able to use like cell phones, having very, very strict codes of like conduct. So I was wondering how that might fit into this overall picture that you're talking about. Okay. Um, yes. Yeah, actually, I, I just wanted to, uh, since we mentioned. <laughs> It's so fine. It's, it's we can fine. hear. Okay. Uh, you know, since we mentioned uh, 2002, I was just wondering, in terms of the monstrous element of uh, generalized gang rapes that you were referring to, Tanika, whether one should not be thinking of Surat in 1992 or 93, because that was one of the incidents which, as you, you know, the late convert to Modiism, uh, Madhu Kishwar's journal had, uh, which is still available on the web has an incredibly detailed uh, account of what really happened there. Uh, if you remember also, it was the first uh, episode of large-scale video recording yes. of these things that was then passed around. Mm -hmm. So I think partly to understand how Hindutva and you know gang uh, rapes mm -hmm. came together, I think 1992 is a very key element, in both in terms of the personnel involved and in terms of the te technology involved and in terms of, as you said, the camaraderie that these uh, episodes of mass violence afford to people across class divisions, which is possible to be, you know, done in this way. Okay, would you like to respond? Uh, yeah, your Anisha. Yes. So uh, I tried to sketch out a kind of general brutalization um, in society and polity, and the tolerance level for brutality is going up in diverse directions. Uh, which has been happening, uh, you know, it's not that it's ever been absent from any society or from any historical period, but it's uh, becoming remarkably aggravated over the past uh, the couple of decades. And there is, I still do not want to say that it's all due to the combined operations of uh, Hindutva come <coughs> a structural adjustments and neoliberal reforms, but there is a remarkable convergence in matters of time. And we need to explore how, uh, you know, how uh, uh, we need to really patiently track how these then translate, how the, this broader context, each of which involves great violence. You know, the violence of neoliberalism is both structural, long-standing, as well as spectacular when it comes to opposition to, you know, movements, social movements against land grab or, you know, strikes in factories and so on. And the, you know, self-professedly violent agenda of Hinduism. How this broader context, through what mediations, it translates into a very violent, vicious, obscene, sexual and social imaginary. So I try to show that in both, uh, or both in different ways, legitimize assaults on vulnerable bodies. Vulnerable bodies of the poor, vulnerable bodies of quote unquote low caste, vulnerable bo bodies of women, vulnerable bodies of religious minorities. That may not be the entire reason why 
you know, we hear so much or see so much of grotesque murders, rapes, and so on, that it can explain part of it. But we can't sort of leap from one to the other. We have to see exactly how it works, and that's a long drawn out process. <coughs> and Suvir, yes, I completely agree. I'm glad that you said that because uh, Surat especially, I mean, it played out the entire scenario again, and also an unborn fetus was involved, I think, and uh, had to be senseless, absolutely. <coughs> so it goes back quite a... And uh, I don't know, maybe in partition, during partition, uh, such spectacular violence became normal for a while, but uh, during the you know, Holocaust uh, that we had. But uh, afterwards, there, I think till the early 90s, that kind of level was not reached. Uh, what's very frightening about uh, today is that they are accumulating fast and furious, and uh, you know numbers are going up. Uh, you know there seems to be a dissatisfaction with forms of violence. You know you have to improvise worse and worse forms almost on a daily basis, and uh, it's something just spinning out of control in many ways. <laughs> You ask about, uh, see, I think, I mean, that parallel is also very much in my mind, not only in schools, but in colleges as well, and uh, all of that. And uh, yes, the same thing had occurred to me when I read about the incident in Bangalore as well. Um, how to explain it? I would say that, in fact, uh, you know, uh, it is usually talked about um, in the framework, which is, it's widely accepted, isn't it, that uh, even in, in, in uh, families and in homes across the uh, class and caste uh, uh, hierarchy, uh, control over women um, is uh, quite uh, central to the ways in which uh, families are structured, caste is structured, and all of that. That is kind of widely accepted. What is probably less widely accepted is that it is not uh, only uh, it, it doesn't. Un, it is not only about disciplining women's labor inside the household. It is also about, uh, you know, it's it's used quite explicitly, and I believe not only in India but otherwise, uh, in a, in for instance China as well, in other countries too, uh, as a tool to discipline uh, of a, a, a gendered labor force as well, a workforce as well. I think. I mean, that's how I understand it now. Yeah. I just would briefly mention in the context of what you said that not only Surat, but also even the uh, Bathani Tola massacres in Bihar, the Dalit massacres, which were also done by the Ranbir Sena, which had a close link up with the, uh, uh, with the RSS. Uh, those two, in a way, foreshadowed what happened in, uh, in Gujarat uh, 2002 in many, many ways. Yes. OK, we have a question here. and. Uh, and Shanaz and um, yeah, you go back. Yeah, and uh, next round. <laughs> yeah. Hello. Yeah. Okay. Uh, the thing is, ever since uh, in the in 1990s, with the privatization, liberalization, and globalization in India. The ordinary people uh, or the working class uh, has been attacked all the time, whichever com uh, party comes uh, to power, whether it's Congress, whether it's BJP. Both of these parties are responsible for communalization as well as anti-worker laws uh, in India. And uh, for example, in 1984, when uh, they attacked Sikhs in Delhi and also uh, uh, Golden Temple in Amritsar, BJP at the, uh, uh, promised to the people, if it comes to power, it will punish the guilty. Now, more than 30 years have passed. Nobody has been punished for that. If they had punished the guilty at that time, then Gujarat incident wouldn't have happened. And after that, whatever happened wouldn't have happened 
if the guilty were punished in the first place. Now the Modi is doing whatever has been happening before him. He is carrying out the same policy. There is no difference between Congress pol policies or the Modi policies. Both of these parties are uh, serving the agenda of the rich in India. They have opened up India for the Indian uh, uh, bourgeoisie as well as the foreign uh, corporations to make it easier for them to make maximum pro profits. And uh, Sorry to interrupt, but can you come to your question, please? Question is how we can change the situation where people don't suffer. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, yes, Shanaz, you had. Actually, I'm working. Yes, yes, it's working. Um, I would like to ask a question, but this directed to both of the speakers. So we're speaking about an increase in violence, and I'm wondering if you might want to make the connection to media, particularly social media. The spectacle of the violence, the eroticization of the violence, and then building a community of would-be violators um, through social media. Because I want to just talk a little bit about, I live in Canada, Canada and we're dealing with uh, dentistry students who opened up a Facebook account. I don't know if you guys have heard of it. And they were talking about, at a particular university, and they were talking about what they would like to do to women when they are the de when they are dentists while they are under chloroform, so there was this whole conversation that was going on. So I was thinking of building this community of would be perpetrators and the use of social media as activists are doing to challenge the violence. It's also happening on the other side. Okay, and we have one more person at the back there. Can you just wait a second for the mic, yeah? Yeah, I just wanted to, uh, you know, build on the connection that was, I mean, uh, what was touched upon in the last question with the social media. But uh, especially the 2012, uh, you know, movement that, that happened in Delhi. I mean, uh, and, and this whole connection of how liberal, liberalization and a certain kind of, um, you know, consciousness has built, I mean, post-liberalization, and a g very grim uh, picture has been drawn already here. But is there like a sa salvaging side to it? I mean, there is, uh, like for example, this whole, uh, I, I mean, the material conditions under which there could be a breakthrough in an urban context today for such, uh, we will have, we'll have to look at, uh, you know, uh, uh, solidarity with the liberals, although you know, will be uncomfortable at after after a point. But I saw when when the whole movement was building up that the liberal voice is so called, which come I mean, coming out uh, uh, you know explicitly in terms of uh, how they define work or how they define you know this whole question of uh, freedom of women. I mean, in the sense if and and if you see materially the question of how. It is important for corporations to to have women working 24 hours uh, at their beck and call uh, in call centers, uh, uh, you know, and having like you know this whole notion about fixing the problem of violence by providing uh, you know cap facilities from pick and drop from from your doorstep to your. So I mean these are these are measures that have been taken in order to plug a gap, but it is also as we as has been pointed out kind of uh, uh, opened up gates to other kind of violences that we, we kind of hadn't been talking about yet. I mean, in, that, in the same manner. So one example was, of course, the Bangalore. Uh, one other example was, of course, in, in the Bangalore uh, garment sector, which is also a very, very recent uh, uh, you know, exposition of how, uh, how liberalization is actually playing in, 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 new, ma in, in new manifestations. So. So, in a, uh, a comment on that. Uh, 
I, I could just, yeah. uh, if your question was addressed to me, I don't know. Uh, or your observation. <laughs> the real question, I don't really know. We'll all have to think together about how to get uh, beyond what's happening. But about the Congress and the um, BJP, uh, you know, you're quite right, absolutely right. The Congress has uh, shown the way in many ways. And the uh, demise of the Congress is richly deserved. There's nothing to be said for it. <laughs> but uh, there, there's still a little bit of difference. Okay, so uh, the Congress will always practice soft and hard communalism. I mean, Delhi, uh, Delhi uh, 1984 was very hard violence, but it had been preceded by the Nelly massacre in, uh, you know, in Assam, so it wasn't the first. Uh, it was in the massacre was of comparable scale. So uh, the Congress would do all this, but this is not the Congress's USP. Okay, the Congress does not sort of uh, rise or fall by communalism. It will do it when it suits it. It will practice it when it suits it. But that's not the only distinctive agenda that the Congress has. It has neoliberalism, it has this, it has that. But prior to Modi, the BJP, to distinguish itself from the Congress, could only refer to communalism. However, it governed in the states under it. There was this that distinguished it from the Congress, that it was a constant making of the Hindu Rashtra through foul means and fair was its USP. Okay? The second thing is that, you know, we all thought that in terms of inviting corporate uh, investment, in terms of uh, very anti-people labor laws and so on, there's nothing that uh, the Manmohan Singh Chidambaram government uh, did uh, or did not do. You know, there, there was nothing left uh, anymore. You know, it had done everything that could have been done. But then the question arises, you know, what was the extra mile that Modi walked that gave Modi the incredible corporate support? That Manmohan Chidambaram did not do. Why did the media, sorry, why did the corporate sector wholeheartedly, single-mindedly, and spectacularly put its weight behind Modi in a way it had never done with the yeah. <laughs> <laughs> because in Gujarat, when Modi was chief minister, he said there's a no need for labor department at all. Yeah. So there you have so, your answer. <laughs> you know, that's the difference, which is something that the Congress government did not say. And the Congress government also, having pushed in, uh, you know, opening up land and so on, it, it also knew how to withdraw from a very tricky situation. When there would be a strong enough popular resistance, it would, you know, uh, dampen the severity of the controls for the time being. BJP left no one in doubt that there would be the land uh, acquisition ordinance, for instance. Uh, the new labor laws that are practiced in Rajasthan. Rajasthan is the laboratory, and it needs to be watched very closely. So these are ways in which the BJP leaves the Congress behind it. It's far more ruthless in its neoliberalism as it's far more ruthless and single-minded. Uh, the second question is uh, about the social media. Shia. The social media, yes, that's, a, that's certainly true. And I think that cuts both ways. It, uh, it's both a cause and a symptom. It also, and that is my uh, you know, response to the last question, it also allows people to mobilize against violence, against repression far more effectively, perhaps, than used to be done. Uh, you know, all the resistance has now become social media based, except for December uh, 16th, uh, 2012, when there were you know, massive street demonstrations. These days, it's happening through social media, really. So it cuts both ways and depends on who uses it how. But that... Uh, you know, uh, the, the case that you were talking about of imagining what can be done to women 
that also happens uh, that gets aggravated as a result of the social media and, and copycatism. Uh, Copycatism, and I remember, we all remember that after the Taj, uh, the attacks on the Taj Hotel, and the, um, uh, uh, you know, when the terrorists were caught, you know, they, when they were arrested, there was a lot of this going around how to torture them. Hmm? Vivid accounts of, you know, vivid descriptions of what the people would like to do to them. Mm -hmm. So it incites that, you know. I, yeah. Um, I'd also like to briefly respond to what you were saying and to add to what Tanika was saying about uh, the Congress. I would say that, you know, I think that uh, you're very right, probably, that in terms of what the Congress would like to do in terms of economic policy and to the poor and so on and so forth, uh, there would be very little difference. But I think that. Uh, what the corporates hope probably uh, Modi can achieve, which they hoped Manmohan could do, but Manmohan did not. And the real hope from Modi, I think, is that uh, they really hope from him what he achieved in Gujarat. It's not that in Gujarat there are not, there are powerful people's movements in Gujarat. There are peasants' movements in Gujarat. There are working class struggles uh, and in Gujarat. But those are not the stories that define Gujarat as the rest of the country or the world knows it, right? He has he managed to use the whole Hindutva mobilization in a way in which uh, the Gujarat story was defined centrally that way. And so the other stories could not become uh, the center stage. They could not become political issues in the way that, say, a Singur or Nandigram did. Uh, you know, or uh, uh, it, it, they, they achieved that, uh, th that in Gujarat. And I think that is what the corporations hope Modi will achieve in the country. I still say it's not, he hasn't achieved it yet. Delhi's result is a reminder and a very um, nasty reminder to him that uh, you, you can't uh, completely, uh, 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 that Hindu consolidation in order to make uh, all other issues take the backstage is far from being achieved. Uh, all, it is not already achieved. And uh, you know some of that hubris probably uh, will be restrained by recent developments. But I still think that basically that is the effort. That is, the, uh, that is what they hope will be achieved. What you uh, uh, said about social media, I, I, I think that mm, uh, another thing I'd like to add also is that uh, the ways in which uh, this whole, uh, it's not just incidents of sexual violence that are uh, certainly social media, the sharing of it, the participation in it, uh, the voyeurism, all of that is of course uh, very much uh, enabled by social media. But I also think that uh, in terms of building up this frenzy, for instance, uh, this whole building up of frenzy over uh, the Muslim, Muslim aggressor, Okay, uh, building up the myth. This, uh, in all of this, uh, I know that uh, social media uh, and uh, uh, the internet are very much uh, being used as vehicles and mediums for it. Probably just as much, if not more, than the protesters uh, against uh, sexual violence and sexual discrimination and so on are doing. So it is, I mean, it, it is after all a tool and could be used by anyone. Um, what you asked, I'm not absolutely sure exactly what you had in mind, but I'll just respond uh, briefly. So you talked about, um, at least to the part about building, uh, you know, you said, uh, you know, uh, building unity with uh, liberals. You see, I, th I don't think that the question of women's freedom and all of that was defined only by liberals in any way, in that way. I would say that, you know, the uh, uh, really what I'm, what I tried to say. Uh, what I feel and what I would elaborate on tomorrow as well, is that uh, the whole agenda of women's freedom is actually something that uh, should not be seen only as a liberal articulation or a demand for uh, by a certain class of women. It is actually, you know, the protests against moral policing should not be just seen as the right of a certain class to be, uh, you know, to kiss in public. It is actually, you know, the protests against moral policing are actually key to and they should be to the protests, uh, to the efforts to mobilize uh, even the working class, even working class women. Uh, you know, the constraints on their freedoms are, uh, uh, and in the uh, using moral policing are just as severe and as as much of a concern. So we probably need to redefine really that. Yeah. Okay. Uh, 
Okay, well, I know there are many more questions. Unfortunately, you know, we are completely out of time, so I apologize for that. But I'd just like to say that this is a conversation which our speakers have begun today and which is going to continue uh, in a series of events, beginning, of course, with the symposium tomorrow, but do also look out for other events on these themes. And I'd just like to finish by, again, thanking our speakers very much for a wonderful...